Okay, everyone, uh, it's 17 past, so they had two minutes extra, plus I'm recording this, so they can, you know, just look at the first five minutes they missed if they can't follow anything later, right? I think that's fair? Okay, so today, the aesthetics of interactivity. Um, Sam and I have been talking, well, should we do this to you? And we decided, well, you know what, we'll just show it to you, and if you pick it up, you'll, you'll see what I mean. Then it's okay, and if not, it's also okay. So, um, this is from the preface of the book that you're not reading that anymore, that's which says, one of the implications of the rules of play, that's that other book you're not using, is that the proper way to understand games is from an aesthetic perspective, in the same way we talk about architecture, literature, or film. It's about reflecting on games. So, as laid out in the following pages, that you're not reading, <laughs> The real domain of game design is the aesthetics of interactive systems, which is also why we're teaching it to you, even if you don't want to do games, because interactive systems is your specialty, right? Mm -hmm. So that's why it will be useful. So that's the foreword to the book Rules of Prey by Frank Lanz. <coughs> so when we discuss aesthetics, I think, although of course I'm biased with my Bachelor in Arts, that art theory, uh, especially that surrounding art criticism, could be <coughs> the starting point. And today, I would, like you to, I would like to work you through a paper that I've read when I was in my bachelor in my first year called Talk About a Painting. Uh, it was written by Michael J. Parsons in 87. So that was when, how old were you guys? How old were you? Not born. I wasn't born. You weren't even born, <laughs> holy. <laughs> okay, shit's old. But you know, paintings don't change that much. Um, so they, he studies one painting from different interpretations to learn something about how people look at art. And, and I think the same insights he had in there, you can use in game design and thinking about game design. So this is hardcore art theory, okay? This is serious business, but you're not required or tested about it in any way. You don't need it in your reflections. I'm not gonna check for that. You're not gonna need it in your game design. It's just, we think it's educational and useful to you, and if you figure it out, then, you know, it's useful. I, I, when I read this at first, I got, like, I think half of it, and then it kind of went to the back of my head, and then a few years later, when I grew a bit in my art appreciation, like, oh, that's what that meant. And so this is a theory that also is like, more like an investment for later in that sense, I think. So also, I'm gonna make Simon look good by having way too much text in these slides, because I'm going to read from them. I'm going to commit a pretty, um, what do you say that, cardinal sin? Mm. Cordial sin? Cardinal. Cardinal. cardinal sin. Yeah. Right. So I'm going to start with the opening sentence. It is proverbial that people differ in their responses to art. It's a very stuffy theory. <coughs> in this article, I will suggest a developmental interpretation of some of these differences, which by which he means the mental development. The interpretation is based on a theory that focuses on how we understand paintings. All right, get on with it. The kind of understandings I have in mind are suggested by a cartoon that appeared once in a New Yorker magazine. It showed a man looking at a directory in an art museum, and the directory read, first floor, sunsets and beautiful paintings. Does anyone know who painted this? I, uh, actually, I kind I've of, it, I, I, I forgot too. Is it Manet or Monet? No. It's a dude. It's a dude, yeah, it's well. Kind of a sword? Could be. I don't know. Check it out. Take a picture and do a Google reverse image search or something. But it's not important. This is a beautiful painting. Second floor, war and ugly paintings. I doubt anyone knows who this is. Oh, no, this is uh, Otto Dix. And he, um, he went through World War I. He was heavily, he's a German as his name kind of implies. He really hated war and he was really critical of nationalism. So this was called Remembering the Glory Days. As like an ironic point, like, oh yeah, everybody's always so like glorious war and then this is what you get from it. So he made a point with this. Third floor, color patches and crazy painting. Does anyone know who that is? Does it live? Hmm? Is that Picasso? No, no. Kandinsky. Uh, it's okay that you don't know this, because you know, this is not your specialty. I'm just like, curious if there's anyone into art here. So, we're going to talk about interpretive frames here. 
People make aesthetic judgments using interpretive frames, meaning how they interpret the aesthetics. And most of the time, people are not aware of them. So much of the time, they, this judgment seems obvious, as if a painting is unmediated. Well, you don't have to worry too much about what it means, but okay. And about which discussion is unnecessary. So you can say the same about games. People will just say, this isn't fun, so you know, that's an aesthetic judgment as well. And then they don't even have to define, explain why that makes the game bad or anything. That's a judgment. So there are some limits to this model. His model has five stages, which have to do with cognitive development. And I'll explain as we go through this. Uh, the, these are not clear-cut boundaries in your brain. Okay? There's no section of your brain that does this level or that level. Right? You don't have five levels of aesthetics in there. And you don't level up as you develop your mental skills. And uh, yeah, I know. It would be cool, but no. There's no experience. I do all the time. Yeah? <laughs> yeah. Do you keep track of it? No. Ah, you're but right. Uneven levels are just like power slots there. Oh, yeah. That's power yeah. <coughs> you figured life out. Nice. Mm. OK. The thing is, reality is fuzzy, complex. This is just a model to make sense of it. You know, it's not the way things are. So we're going to talk about this painting called Into the World, There Came a Soul Called Ida by Ivan Albright. OK, I'm going to write the description he had of the painting. The subject of Ida is a woman well past her prime of life, overweight and showing some obvious signs of aging and ill health. She is sitting in her dressing room looking in a mirror. The style of Ida is melodramatic and exaggerated. There is a single light overhead cast uh, overhead uh, that casts strong shadows. The woman is both centrally full length occupying most of the canvas. There are strong contrasts of dark and light. There is very heavy texture on the surface and everything is in sharp focus. The mood, one might say, is Dorian Gray-ish, whose portrait Albert, uh, Albright painted for the film of that name. Right? So this is, a, this is what they call, like, they try to give an objective description of the painting. Um, it doesn't tell us if it's good or bad with this. So let's look. So he interviews five people. And he describes what they say, and it is, he analyzes what they say. So he starts with Emil, who's five years old. Okay. What do you think of this painting? Ooh, it's pretty. How come it's pretty? <coughs> because there's a man, maybe a woman or something, and then it has a chair and a rug and a table, and she has pretty shoes. Oh, it could be a girl. And she has a pretty dress. It just looks pretty. Which part is prettiest? This part, the table. So where the bottle and the flowers are? Yes, and the leaves and stuff. I really <coughs> like it. So at that age, you are pretty innocent of social norms, what is beautiful and what isn't. And he just simply expresses whatever directly appeals to him, because he doesn't feel any pressure to fit in or something. And the reason this partially happens is because he doesn't quite have a theory of mind yet. Now, theory of mind is a pretty advanced cognitive concept. It basically is being aware that you have a mind and being aware that you have a mind and that it's a different mind from mine. And being aware that what I know, you don't have to know. So the way they can test this, they can show this. If you have like a five-year-old and you say, okay, you play with puppets, right? Jack and Jill are in the room and uh, Jack left his sandwich on the table and then he leaves. And then, uh, I don't know, the, the, the window is open. And the wind blows the sandwich off the table. And uh, Jack comes back and gets really angry at Jill. Um, why is that? And then uh, they don't know. The reason is because Jack thinks she threw it off the table or something. But because he knows it's off the table, he also thinks Jack knows it fell off the table because of the wind. So he doesn't understand why he would be mad. Right? Um, which means, if he doesn't have that awareness, right, that judgments must be egocentric because the whole world is his world. So he doesn't focus, uh, so that's why he just like personal appeal, right? And also, as you can see from the way he responds, he doesn't focus on Ida, he does not use her to make sense of the painting because, you know, he doesn't care about what she thinks because he doesn't know the concept of what she thinks. 
she doesn't she can't use what how she feels as a way to make sense of the painting because he doesn't have that sense yet so he doesn't interpret the painting as a whole he has has the items one by one and you can have game equivalents of this just think of the games that you played yourself or know other people to play like these interactive storybooks where every item on the screen is clickable and it, you know you click and then you have a little silly animation this is for little kids well this is why because this is what appeals to them at that <coughs> age they can't make more sense of things at that time so that's stage one you with me right so now we go to Katie who will appear to be very mean but she isn't it's just she's not ready yet let's put it that way Will you describe the painting for me? Well, there's a lady sitting in a chair with her legs exposed. They're bare and they're really ugly. They've got bumps all over them and she's sitting there with a powder puff in one hand and the mirror in the other and I guess she's doing her makeup. I think this is quite a bright 12 year old, by the way. And there's a table by her with her makeup, jars and flowers and she's, I don't know, she's got fabric all over the floor. She's not dressed very nicely. So there's like her bumps and the fabric on the floor, right? So what do you think the theme of the painting is? Uh, a lady doing a makeup. I don't know. Is she a young woman? No, she's middle-aged, a little older. Okay, when I changed the resolution, the whole thing went bonkers, so I hope this is still readable. Oh, it's just on the screen. Okay, good. What's the feeling in this painting? I don't like it. Just look at this. He asks her, what's the feeling in this painting? And she answers, I don't like it. See, she doesn't actually answer his question. She answers what she thinks. Why not? I don't know, it's just that the legs are getting on my nerves. Why do you suppose the artist painted this? He was angry with his mother-in-law. Okay. I don't know, I don't, I don't know. He just felt like it. He saw some lady going down the street and said, that looks sickening, and he decided <laughs> to paint her. He must have been angry at her for some reason. Like she's just trying to make sense of the, something that cannot make sense to her yet. Is it a subject you'd expect a painter to choose? No. Why? Well, if a painter was going to paint something, most painters paint beautiful women, or they really look nice in beautiful surroundings, and this is just, it just so contrasts with that. It's not a beautiful painting? I don't think so. What should a painting do? Entertain people. Like, I won't look at a painting like that. Well, I will look at it because it's so disgusting, but I'll pass it up and go look at the beautiful scenery or, or a woman sailing in a boat or something. I mean, this is just different. Is there anything that could be do, done to improve the painting? Use better colors. It's all sort of brown, maybe purple or something. And make her have a better expression on her face instead of just yuck. <laughs> so what's the feeling in this painting again? I don't know. I just don't like it. It's too drab, too yucky. Do you think it's a good painting? Well, it's good. He obviously knew what he was painting. It sort of looks real. I mean, the bulge on her legs and everything. Just because you don't like it doesn't mean it's not a good painting. Okay. So this sounds very harsh of her, right? Her judgment is based on what she perceives social norms to be at this age, because she's figured that out by now, what those are. And they're accepted and stated as facts. She doesn't, like, she, there's no hesitation to just say that she's really ugly. Whereas most of us would be like, eh, take it easy there. But at that stage, that's normal that you, you judge harshly like that. Because she's not aware that this is interpretive. It's a fact for her. Like, you know, she doesn't know, like, it's, uh, that's just your opinion, man. Like, she doesn't have that awareness yet. So she does have a somewhat developed theory of mind, which is why she understands these social norms. She knows that others have their own mind, and that they're different from her own, they know different things. But she still assumes they're much like her own. She still assumes they think in the same way, so she believes they would have come to the same judgment. Because why wouldn't they if they have the same type of mind? Stand versus going? Mm -hmm. So that's why she accepts these judgments as facts. So that leads to that mentality. Yeah, I just said that. Okay, I got ahead of myself. So you got a few typical assumptions as a consequence about how people judge paintings and how people judge games. So this is where it gets interesting to you, hopefully. The medium should get out of the way. 
because it's you know the point of a painting is to depict something so the medium should get out of the way of that so realism is good that's why the painting is good even though she doesn't like it he knew what he was painting it sort of looks real well you can say the exact same thing about games you know how many times have you heard all oh, those next-gen graphics are so much better and those physics simulations are so much better well sure does that make the game better necessarily well, no, I can easily disprove that because there's decades old ugly computer games that I love and there's very realistic modern games that have no appeal at all, right? So, so there is something wrong in this conclusion. But if you think like this, it's very logical you come to that conclusion. The other thing is that the quality of the subject is the quality of the painting. That's the other mis misinterpretation. So sunsets and beautiful paintings, war and ugly paintings at the beginning, right? Ugly woman, ugly painting, bad painting. So in the game equivalent, the point of a game is to entertain the players or to be fun, right? It doesn't have to be, but that's what people think at this stage. So the experience, the quality of a game is the experience of playing it. This game is bad because it's not fun to play. But we have things like abusive games or games that make you feel miserable to make a point. But at this stage, you're not ready for that yet. And it takes actually quite a bit of education to grow beyond this mentality. I, I personally think a lot of adult people also think in these terms. Um, and I don't blame them, because you know, it takes some effort to get out of it. And here's where the last bit fell off. God darn it. Um, I don't know what I'm saying here. <laughs> oh, I hope this will not be a much mm. something. Yeah. Well, uh, it's probably not that. It's not important. Not important. Okay. <laughs> so that was that was a bit of a that was the introduction, the first two stages. You could more or less follow it, I hope. So what I would like to do, just to wake up a bit, because it's just like me dumping information in your head, which is always you know tiresome, is to kind of turn around if you're in front of someone or <coughs> like try to talk with each other about maybe the games you're making in your group or games you've played and, and try to relate them to this theory like how would people judge them or misjudge them how do you judge them can I ask you to like talk about some games that you immediately thought of when I showed you this for example and, right just like just to practice with this theory a bit and kind of see if you make sense also if you're confused you can ask the guy next to you or girl next to you like what do you make of that right you got about 10 minutes yes